Good evening, good morning, and good day, wherever you are. Welcome to Biblical Quests. We are a worldwide scripture study community seeking to fulfill Yah's commandment to his followers to meditate on the Torah day and night, so that we may be like a tree planted by streams of water that gives its fruit in its season, so all that we do will prosper. This is week six of our 52 weeks cycle of chronological reading through the Torah, prophets, and Yeshua's words, reminding you that we are currently going through year one, which means that today the deep dive will be on the Torah portion in Genesis. The reading and open discussion will explore several sources, in particular the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint, and the Hebrew English Masoretic. Where relevant, we will also explore extra canonical books as found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We are humbled and excited to share this journey with you all. Let us pray. We thank you for everything that you provide, everything that you give, all your wisdom. Father, may you continue to guide us in our search and our hearts for truth and spirit. May you bless all those that hear your words, and may they all continue to seek to better understand what your words mean and what they are speaking to each individual out there. May this sharing be a blessing to all those that hear or watch. And may your name be glorified in all that we do and say in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, welcome everyone. This is week six of our deep dive cycle. And I am live streaming the presentation. So if you click on it, you can see it. Also, I just dropped the PDF of the presentation at the recordings channel. As you can see, this is our master schedule for the scripture portion and this week portion includes chapters from Genesis, Isaiah and Matthew and we are going to deep dive on the Torah on Genesis but we highly recommend that everyone will still make an effort to read the prophets and Yeshua at your own time. So today we will cover chapters 21 through chapter 24 in Genesis. Let us start. Genesis chapter 21 And Yahweh visited Sarah as he had said, and Yahweh did to Sarah as he had promised. And she conceived, and Sarah bore to Abraham a son in his old age at the appointed time that God had told him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised Isaac his son when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac, his son, was born to him. And Sarah said, God had made laughter for me. All who hear will laugh for me. And she said, Who would announce to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne a son to Abraham in his whole old age. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Agar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne Abraham, mock, mocking. Then she said to Abraham, Drive out this slave woman and her son, for the son of this slave woman will not be here with my son, with Isaac. And the matter displeased Abraham very much on account of his son. Then God said to Abraham, Do not be displeased on account of the boy and on account of the slave woman. Listen to everything that Sarah said to you, for through Isaac your offspring will be named. And I will also make the son of the slave woman into a nation, for he is your offspring. Then Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder. And he sent her away with a child, and she went wandering about in the wilderness in Beersheba. And when the water was finished from the skin, she put the child under one of the bushes, and she went and she sat opposite him at a distance, a bow shot away, for she said, Let me not see the child's death. So she sat away from him and lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the cry of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from the heavens and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God had heard the cry of the boy from where he is. Get up, take up the boy, and take him with your hand. 
for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water and she went and filled the skin with water and gave a drink to the boy. And God was with the boy and he grew and lived in the wilderness and he became an expert with a bow. And he lived in the wilderness of Paran and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. And it happened that at the time Abimelech and Ab Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, said to Abram, God is with you in all that you do. So now swear to me here by God that you will not deal with me falsely or with my descendants or my posterity according to the kindness that I have done to you. You shall pledge to do with me and with the land where you have dwelled as an alien. And Abraham said, I swear. Then Abraham complained to Abimelech on account of the well of water that, ser that servants of Abimelech had seized. And Abimelech said, I do not know who did this thing. Neither did you tell me, nor have I heard of it except for today. And Abraham took sheep and cattle and gave them to Abimelech. And the two of them made a covenant. Then Abraham set off seven wool lamps of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven wool lamps that you have set off by themselves? And he said, You shall take the seven wool lamps from my hand as proof on my behalf that I dug this well. Therefore, that place is called Beersheba, because there the two of them swore an oath. And they made a covenant at Beersheba, and Abimelech and Fichol, his army commander, stood and returned to the land of the Philistines. And he planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there he called on the name of Yahweh, the everlasting God. And Abraham dwelt as an alien in the land of the Philistine many days. Okay, thoughts and insight regarding chapter 21. So first I would like to talk about barrenness in the Bible, and I sure hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Barrenness is a common theme in scripture. The definition of barrenness is the inability of men and women to procreate. In the Bible, a woman's infertility might also be marked by the phrase, she had no progeny or sons. Sometimes it's used to highlight Yah's judgment on a rebellious people. For example, Job 15, 33-35, he will shake off his a unripe fruit like the vine, and he will cast off his blossom like the olive tree. For the company of the godless is barren, and fire consumes the tents of who, of those who accept bribes. They conceive trouble and bring forth mischief, and their womb prepares deceit. Sometimes it's used to showcase Yah's glory in opening up the wombs of women who no one would have dreamt ever could conceive. Genesis 25:21, And Isaac prayed to Yahweh on behalf of his wife, for she was barren. And Yahweh responded to his prayer, and Rebekah his wife conceived. In Judges 13:3, And an angel of Yahweh appeared to the woman, and he said to her, Behold, you are infertile and have not born children, but you will conceive and bear a son. Regardless of how barrenness is used, it carries the same heavy cloud of shame wherever it is portrayed. If the promised seed was supposed to come through the woman, the barren woman was out of the running for bearing this hoped-for child. On top of that, fruitlessness in the form of children was seen to be a sign of God's favor. Without the fruit of the womb, not only were a woman seen as a condemned sinner, but also as a woman without purpose. In Exodus 23:26, there will be no one suffering miscarriage or infertile in your land. I will make full the number of your days. But one of the overarching messages of barrenness in the Bible is that Yah, at his own will, can reverse it against all odds. 
In Psalm 113, the psalmist is praising Yah's sovereign, powerful, and all-loving hand of blessing on those who previously were infertile. Yah is in the business of taking the most unlikely of people, despised and rejected in the world's estimation, and giving them abundance through his kind provision. Psalms 113.9 He causes the barren woman of the house to dwell as the happy mother of children. Praise Yah. The Bible contains seven stories of barren women that with Yah's intervention end up conceiving. Sarah, wife of Abraham and mother of Isaac. Rebecca, wife of Isaac and mother of Jacob and Esau. Rachel, wife of Jacob and mother of Joseph and Benjamin. The unnamed wife of Manoah and mother of Samson. Hannah, wife of Elkanah and mother of Samuel the prophet. The Shunammite woman or Shunammite woman and acolyte of the prophet Elisha. And last, Elizabeth, wife of Zechariah the priest and mother of John the Baptist. Barrenness was often associated with sin. This was an extension of the belief that maladies were the result of sin. We see this plays out in Genesis 20, in which King Abimelech's wife and servants are barren because of Abraham's lie. In 2 Samuel 6, 20-23, where Michal, Saul's daughter, marks King David rendering her barren. In Genesis 30, 23, where Rachel remarks, God has taken away my disgrace upon becoming pregnant. And in Luke 1, 25, when Elizabeth exclaims, thus the Lord, the Lord has done for me to take away my disgrace among people. As a result, all these women suffered and agonized over a prolonged period of infertility, sometimes exacerbated by the presence of a less beloved, though more fertile, co-wife. Is infertility indeed a punishment for sin? Short answer, no. Although some interpreters try to identify some rationale for the matriarch's infertility, the Bible itself attributes no fault to them. They are simply barren and blameless. In the Bible, there was a broader understanding that every successful procreation was the result of divine intervention. Yah had to open the womb in order for conception, to, for conception to occur. Ultimately, it was Yah who was seen as holding the keys to opening and closing the womb. In Genesis twenty nine thirty one, when Yahweh saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. The absence of this miracle could hardly be a reflection of some human sin. And in the case of the barren matriarchs, it is never described as such. Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Samson's mother, Hannah, the Shunammite woman, and Elizabeth were all barren at first. But Yah, who holds the key to fertility, reversed it. Yah terminated terminated years of barrenness, age is no barrier to the power of Yah. Luke 1.36 And behold, your relative Elizabeth, she also has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Procreation was considered a blessing, a blessing in the Bible, and it was a commandment. The world was created to be inhabited. Isaiah 45, 18, For thus says Yahweh, who created the heavens, He is God, who formed the earth and who made it. He himself established it. He did not create it as emptiness. He formed it for inhabiting. Yah's blessings bestowed on Israel 
always included fertility, as we can see in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, as well as the absence of barrenness, as we can see in Exodus and Deuteronomy. In Leviticus 26, 9, And I will turn to you, and I will make you fruitful, and I will make you numerous, and I will keep my covenant with you. And in Exodus 23, 26, There will be no one suffering miscarriage or infertile in your land. I will make full the number of your days. Often these biblical women suffer deep shame as a consequence. Their barrenness attributed to some hidden wrong sin or flaw. Children are seen as the greatest blessing and are a re reward to obedient servants of Yah. Psalms 127, 3-5 Look, children are the heritage of Yahweh. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. They shall not be put to shame when they speak with enemies at the gate. And Psalms 128, 3-4 Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots about your table. Look, for thus shall a man be blessed who fears Yahweh. Yah makes a way when there could never be a way. Yah promised to take away barrenness from the lives of those who serve him. The matriarch's barrenness emphasizes that it is Yah who disrupts continuity in the transition from one generation to the next and then selects the true heir to the covenant. Yeshua's forerunner, John the Baptist, came through the most unlikely means, an old barren woman and her equally old husband. And Yeshua came through a virgin who had no possible way of conceiving apart from the sovereign hand of Yah. Yah takes what is impossible and makes a way when there could never be a way. In Habakkuk 3, 17-19, Though the fig tree does not blossom, nor there be fruit on the vines, the yield of the olive tree fails, and the cultivated fields do not yield food. The flock is cut off from the animal pen, and there is no cattle in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in Yahweh. I will exult in the God of my salvation. Yahweh, my Lord, is my strength. The childless matriarchs became important metaphors for consolation and comfort, just as central female figures in the Bible were deemed barren and then granted pro progeny through divine interve intervention, the daughter of Zion, Jerusalem, would once again be blessed with children following the return from exile. Isaiah 54, 1-17 Sing for joy, barren woman who is not born and he is referring to daughter of Zion, burst forth into rejoicing and rejoice. She who has not been in labor. For the children of the desolate woman are more than the children of the married woman, says Yahweh. Enlarge the sight of your tent and let them stretch out the tent curtain of your dwelling place. You must not spare. Make your tent cords long and strengthen your pegs. For you will spread out to the right and to the left, and your descendants will be here to the nations, and they will inhabit desolate towns. And I'm jumping to seven. I abandoned you for a short moment, but I will gather you with great compassion. I hid my face from you for a moment in the flowing of anger, but I will have compassion on you with everlasting faithfulness, says your Redeemer, Yahweh. This is the inheritance of the servants of Yahweh and their legal rights from me, declares Yahweh. Yah is in the barrenness. We have to believe that, even when we don't feel it. For without Yah, there is no hope. In the Bible, hope is not a passion for the possible, but a passion for the promised and often the impossible. As life sometimes takes on the form of barrenness, through empty womb or lonely heart. Finding joy in Yah can be challenging. Rejoicing in the emptiness can feel counterintuitive, but it is the exact 
thing needed for the journey. Psalms 39, 7, and now, O Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is for you. Next, I wanted to touch on another point in Genesis 21, and I asked myself, was Isaac an immaculate conception? So the Tanakh is very specific when reporting to us about a man and a woman having sexual relations. It either uses the verb to know, Yada in Hebrew, as in the following verses. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. Then Adam knew his wife again, and she gave birth to a son. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you. And last, then Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and Yahweh remembered her in due time. Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. The, the Tanakh also uses the verb to come into, ve'yavo el, as in the following verses. And he, Abram, went into Hagar, and she conceived. And Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. And it happened that in the evening he, Laban, took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him, Jacob. And he, Jacob, went into her. Then he also went into Rachel. Then she gave him Bilhaf, her female slave, as a wife, and Jacob went into her and Bilhah conceived. And last, almost last, and Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite there whose name was Shua, and he took her and went into her, and she conceived. And last, and he, Judah, turned aside to Tamar at the roadside and said, Please come, let me come into you. And he said, What is the pledge that I must give to you? And she said, Your seal, your cord, and your staff that is in your hand. And he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. So as you can see, there are two ways in the Bible to describe sexual relations. When it comes to Agar, Ishmael was conceived naturally, as we saw in Genesis 16.4, and Abraham went into Hagar and she conceived. However, with Isaac, the text is completely silent in regard to Abraham actually coming into or knowing Sarah prior to her conceiving. Here is what the text does say, Genesis 21, 1-2. And Yahweh visited Sarah as he had said, and Yahweh did to Sarah as he had promised, and she conceived, and Sarah bore to Abraham a son in his old age at the appointed time that God had told him. The book of Jubilees reports the following, Jubilees 16, 12 through 13. In the middle of the sixth month, Yah visited Sarah and did to her as he had spoken, and she conceived. And she gave birth to a son in the third month, in the middle of the month, at the time of which Yah had spoken to Abraham on the festival of the first fruits of the harvest, Isaac was born. born. No physical contact between Abraham and Sarah is reported in both Genesis and Jubilees. It's all about Yahweh visiting and doing something, quote-unquote, to Sarah, and she miraculously conceives as a result. The inevitable conclusion may be that while Ishmael's conception was exclusively through natural physical means, Isaac's conception was exclusively through a miraculous divine intervention without any physical cooperation by Abraham. Just a thought. Any questions, insights, comments regarding chapter 21? Yeah, I think I might have seen something in the comparisons between go into and no. Can you go back to that slide real quick? Yeah, sure. So all the ones, well, um, maybe it doesn't work because I was noticing when you got to the went into ones, so Hagar, he went into Hagar, but that was out of, it seems like not trusting Yah, 
that Sarah would bore him a child. Yes. Then you, go, then you go to the next one, and it says he went into Leah, which is not even the one that they had an agreement for. It was for Rachel. So, like, that one had something weird going on that wasn't quite right. I mean, have- they. my understanding was that it was dark and... <laughs> He thought he was he married Rachel and he slept with her and in the morning he realized it's Leah. Exactly. So yeah. he didn't know it was Leah and yeah. that's not what he thought was going on. Yeah. So when we get to the next one, Rachel, he's already laid with Leah and the law says you can't lay with two sisters while the other one's still alive. But even though Rachel's the one he wanted, he had already laid with her sister. So according to the law, that's got a problem with it. Then you get to the next one and it says, Bilha. Um, yeah, then you have Bilha, and that's like another Hagar situation going on. There. Then you get to Judah, and it said, the daughter of a certain Canaanite. Yes. That one, no, no, as well, but not being part of Israel, like Canaanite. Then you have Tamar, which, you know, the, uh, the widow of his son. Yeah. Type. That's got something weird going on. So I just thought it was strange <laughs> that I went into all had something weird going on. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. You're trying to find a common denominator, but keep in mind, I only used only a few examples. I didn't list all of the examples. So maybe there are other examples, but that's an interesting thing. Those two ter- terms always describe sexual relation. But what you're saying is maybe there is a common denominator that whenever they use via vo el to come into, it's usually in a funky situation and interesting. And I just want to say one more thing about the Baroness. It definitely gives me a lot of hopes. I've been with my wife for 11 years and we still haven't conceived yet, not for lack of trying. So just knowing that y'all can, when he chooses, when it's his time, he can open the womb whenever he wants to know how old you are. Yeah, yeah. So we need to pray. Yeah, we need to pray here. for Yah to open her womb because He has the key. Yeah. Yeah, that's a blessing to to hear that for you that you haven't taken alternative measures because I often think about that in our modern day because I don't think it, that we view barrenness in our society obviously as they did in biblical times or even in older ancient times because children are are a blessing and have been a blessing but obviously children aren't viewed that way in our society today and people and if somebody does want to have children they always go the fertility route instead of praying to Yah and I understand that if they're not God-fearing people they wouldn't take that route but that's a real blessing to hear that you are still praying and waiting and definitely will be praying for you on behalf of that, for sure. I will add that to my prayer list. I just think that it's interesting about how they went about all of this and that how we don't see and view that in our day and age today. One thing that I thought was really interesting of this is that one that talked about Sarah laughing, a couple chapters earlier in, I think it was in seventeen. I never seen this before, but it actually that Abraham actually laughed before Sarah, which I thought was really interesting. <laughs> In seventeen seventeen, uh, it says, "And Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said mm-hmm. in his heart, Will a child be born to a man one hundred years of age?'" I thought that was quite curious. And your thoughts on Isaac being a natural con- divine conception? I've never heard of that before, but that it just piques my curiosity on that. Yeah, it just came to me when I was reading that chapter. I was like, wow, that's an immaculate conception because I was missing all of the terminology that I'm used to. And then I started researching it and I'm like, wow, that definitely could be because the terminology is not there. It's just Yahweh doing something and she conceives. I thought the Isaac piece was brilliant and laying that out as a good possibility. And then... Regarding the two sisters with Leah and Rachel, my thought on that one is that he was already pledged to Rachel as a contract with her father. And the father was the one who deceived him because of that deception. I believe that he still was bound to Rachel, the first one that he had chose and continued with that. But since the father deceived him, 
and gave him Leah, and he had laid with her. He was already, he was already committed in that aspect, so he he had both. Yeah. As we know with the Torah, there are guidelines, and there are circumstances that may get through or by under certain scenarios and that scenario was not an intentional scenario on his part rachel leah's father was the one who deceived him and put him in that situation just like with tamar doing what she did she deceived uh, judah and it, it still the child was still born and so forth but they knew they couldn't continue because of that relationship and did not want to and in this scenario, I just think it was that scenario where it just happened that way, not intentionally. Yeah, I agree with you on this one. I wanted to also make a comment about the two sisters, you know, about Leah and Rachel, that, that was right. But we also see that for what the Torah does say in Leviticus about the two sisters, because the Torah says that, that they'll cause rivalry, we see that's exactly what happened between the two sisters that there was a jealousy and a rivalry and there was like this competition back and forth between the two about having the children and it is quite curious too about how they treated Jacob in this and it was like they were it was almost become like a game where he was being used as a pawn back and forth to them and yes. I like Jacob's reaction and even to Rachel when he's like who am I like God don't <laughs> exactly. be you could tell he was getting really pissed at all yes. this stuff and was getting really <laughs> tired back and yes. forth but yeah I just thought that was pretty funny yeah and it happened after these days God tested Abraham and he said to him Abraham and he said here I am and he said take your son your only child Isaac look Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains where I will tell you. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and he took two of his servants with him, Isaac his son. And he chopped wood to a burnt offering. And he got up and went to the place which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up, lifted up his eyes, and he saw the place at a distance. And Abraham said to his servants, You stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go up there. Worship, then we will return to you. And Abraham, the wood of the burnt offering, placed it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and the two of them went together. And Isaac said to Abraham, his father, my father, he said, here I am, son. And he said, here is the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went together, and they came to the place that God had told them, and Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood. Then he bound out Isaac, his son, and placed him on the altar atop the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. And the angel of Yahweh called to him from heaven and said, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not stretch out your hand against the boy. Do not do anything to him. For now I know that you are one who shares God, since you have not withheld your son, your only child, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a ram was caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place, Yahweh will provide. For which reason it is said today, on the mountain of Yahweh it shall be provided. And the angel of Yahweh called to Abraham a second time from heaven. And he said, I swear by myself, declares Yahweh, that because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only child, that I will certainly bless you and greatly multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is by the shore of the sea and your offspring will take possession of the gate of his enemies all the nations of the earth will be blessed through your offspring because you have listened to my voice and abraham returned to his servants and they got up and went together to beersheba and abraham lived in beersheba and it happened that after these things it was told to abraham look nopa has also born children to your brother Nathan. Who was his firstborn, and who was his brother, and Kemuel, the father of Elam, and Kesed, Azel, Gildash, Jidlap, and Bethuel. Now Bethuel fathered Rebekah. These eight milk the boards in the horn, brother of Abraham, his concubine, whose name was Reumach, also or Teba, Daham, Tahash, and Makah. Thank you. Thoughts and insights regarding chapter 22.
So I have a lot of thoughts on this chapter, so bear with me. The first thing is testing Abraham or teaching a lesson. Whenever a biblical text starts with the words, and it happened that after these things, we can expect a direct relationship between the previous passage to the passage we are about to read. We can rest assured about that. So what did we read before? An odd story, a bit out of place, leaving us with a vague feeling of what was exactly the point of it. The end of that story is an oath, a covenant that Abraham swears to Abimelech. Genesis 20, 23, 24, and 32. So now swear to me hereby, God, that you will not deal with me falsely or with my descendants or my posterity. According to the kindness that I have done to you, you shall pledge to do with me and with the land where you have dwelt as an alien. And Abraham said, I swear. And they made a covenant at Beersheba, and Abimelech and Fichol, his army commander, stood and returned to the land of Philistines. On a side note, in chapter 26, we are going to encounter a biblical deja vu reading, a pretty much identical story to this one, except that this time it's Isaac, not Abraham, that is claiming his wife is his sister and is interacting with the same Abimelech. I'll circle back to this strange, strangeness next week. Back to chapter 22. Immediately after Abraham's entering into a covenant with a foreign king, Yah is testing Abraham. The relationship between these two events is most definitely implied by the text, and it happened that after these things, God tested Abraham, which may also be read as follows. And it happened that after Abraham took the liberty of entering into a covenant with a foreign king on behalf of all of Isaac's offspring, God tested Abraham. Consider some of the details of this story. Yah asks Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, and not just Isaac. He says, Isaac, your son, your only son whom you love. Those are formu formulaic statements on Yah's part, but they are also packing into what Abraham is being asked to do a certain density of drama that suggests that Yah is emphasizing the implication of what he is asking Abraham to do. To sacrifice Isaac means effectively to leave his family behind just as Yah had first asked Abraham to leave behind his family in Chaldea, and just as Yah asked Abraham to leave behind his name and his identity and become Abraham. Indeed, because Yah had established the covenant with Abraham through Isaac and not through Ishmael, Abraham's other son, the call to sacrifice Isaac meant that Abraham was being asked to sacrifice not just his name and identity, but also and especially to sacrifice his entire progeny, the progeny that he had promised him through Isaac. Over the years, countless of Jewish and Christian theologians and scholars have tried to explain the offering of Isaac as a sacrifice, also referred to as the binding of Isaac. Medieval thinkers were disturbed at the idea of Yaz testing Abraham, as if the purpose of the Akedah were to provide Yah with information he did not already possess. Maimonides proposed that the words God tested Abraham do not mean that he put him through a test, but that he made the example of Abraham serve as a test case of the extreme limits of the love and fear of Yah. For now I know that you are one who fears God means that Yah has made known to all men how far man is obliged to go in fearing him. According to Nides, Another famous commentator, the Akedah focuses on the problem of reconciling Yah's foreknowledge with human free will. 
Yeah, knew how Abraham would behave. But from Abraham's point of view, the test was real, since he had to be rewarded not only for his potential willingness to obey, but for actually and unequivocally obeying. Of all the interpretations given to the Akedah, it seems that the Rashbams is perhaps the harshest and most difficult and tragic of them all. Rashbam was a biblical commentator from the 12th century and the grandson of, a fa of the famous biblical commentator Rashi. Rashbam paid special attention to how this chapter begins with the words, and it happened that after these things, and as a result saw so an inevitable relationship and causation that most scholars could not face. He proposed that the testing of Abraham was a direct punishment for Abraham entering into a covenant with Abimelech, a covenant rooted in Abraham's pride, which came about following the birth of Isaac. In other words, after the birth of Isaac, Abraham felt he can now connect with the peoples of the land and strike alliances and enter into covenants with them. However, this was not his destiny. Let's recall what Yah promised Abraham in Genesis 17, 1-9. When Abraham was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to Abraham and he said to him, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be blameless, so that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you exceedingly. Then Abraham fell upon his face and God spoke with him, saying, As for me, behold my covenant, behold, my covenant shall be with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. Your name shall no longer be called Abraham, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful, I will make you nations, and kings shall go out from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and between your offspring after you throughout their generation as an everlasting covenant to be as God for you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land in which you are living as an alien, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting property, I will be to them as God. And God said to Abraham, Now as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. Where exactly did Yah mention that the promise to the land will come about through covenants and peaceful alliances with the peoples of the land? In other words, which part of I will give as in uh, I as in El Shaddai, El Elyon, El Olam, the one and only Yahweh, did Abraham not understand? Through the Akedah then, Yah is telling Abraham, you are proud of the son I gave you, and now you feel worthy of entering into covenants and alliances on behalf of this son and his progeny with foreign kings, nations who inhabit the land, I promise to give you at my own time and in my own manner. Is that it? Now go and bind your son, your only son, whom you love, as a burnt offering to me and see what benefit entering into covenants with foreign kings on behalf of all of Isaac's offspring brings to you. Harsh interpret interpretation, but passable. No matter which interpretation you are drawn to, while it was a merit in Abraham to be willing to sacrifice his only son to Yah, it was Yah's nature and merit that shine through this story, as he would not accept such an abominable and unethical tribute. And it was his purpose, among other things, to establish that truth right from the beginning of his relationship with Abraham and his offspring. In Deuteronomy 12, Yah says, 
Moses says, when Yahweh your God has cut off the nations whom you are about to go to, to dispossess them before you, and you have dispossessed them, and you live in their land, take care so that you are not ens ensnared into in imitating them after their being destroyed from before you. <coughs> and so that you not inquire concerning their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods, and does I myself want to do also? You must not do so toward Yahweh your God, because of every detestable thing they have done for their gods, Yahweh hates. For even their sons and their daughters they would burn in the fire to their gods. All of the things that I am commanding you, you must diligently observe. You shall not add to it and you shall not take away from it. So I'm suggesting that one of the main things that came out of this chapter is, it is that Yah uh, views such tributes as abominable and unethical and he would never accept those tributes. Next, I wanted to talk a little bit about the parallels between the banishment of Ishmael and the Akedah of Isaac. So comparing the story of the Akedah in Genesis 22 to the story of the banishment of Hagar and Ishmael in the previous chapter suggests a particular mistake Abraham made. The two stories are striki strikingly parallel in both. Yah tells Abraham that he needs to eliminate his son, banish in the case of Ishmael, kill in the case of Isaac. Abraham rose up early in the morning to execute Yah's directive. The son's end is drawing near. Ishmael is about to die of thirst, is left under a bush by his mother, and Isaac is about to be slaughtered by his own father. At the last minute, an angel appears to offer a reprieve on behalf of Yah. The appearance of the angel is followed by blessings from the future. The salvation is tied to the parents seeing something new, a well of water in the case of Hagar and a ram in the case of Abraham. Each story ends with notices related to the children's marriages. In both stories, the central theme is whether the firstborn son of Abraham will survive the ordeal into which he has been placed by a father preeminently obedient to Yah's command. One important difference between the stories relates to the issue of Yah's covenant with the patriarch. Ishmael and his Egyptian mother are banished. Ishmael marries an Egyptian girl and will not inherit his father. Isaac, on the other hand, is destined to inherit his father's blessing and marry within his father's family. But there is one more difference between the stories that is very striking and especially important to note. The story of Hagar and Ishmael describes Hagar's reaction to her plight in Genesis 21:16, And she went and she sat opposite him at a distance, a bow shot away, for she said, Let me not see the child's death. So she sat away from him and lifted up her voice and wept. This is immediately followed by the message from the angel reassuring Hagar that Yah has heard her cry and reassuring her about the future of her son. In the story of the Akedah, however, Abraham never cries out for mercy for Isaac. And for that case, for Ishmael too. Abraham crying and asking for mercy is painfully missing in this story and in the banishment of Ishmael's story too. We all agree that Abraham should have protested. He did so to save Lot. So why not when it came to saving his son, his only son whom he loves? We all agree that he should have resisted, a command that seems to be unethical, and we hardly have to point out that murdering a child is not ethical. Demands, at the least, an attempt to pray to Yah for mercy and compassion. The Tanakh does not, of course, criticize Abraham for having offered Isaac. It could not. 
Instead, it proceeds to tell us that he has said, for now I know that you are one who fears God. However, it still finds a way to indirectly criticize. Abraham didn't have mercy on his children. It may be that he had no choice, that faced with the overwhelming command of Yah, even a loving father must ask, act as he did. But surely he could have pleaded, beseeched, implored. As the psalm, psalmist tells us, Psalms 1, 103.13, As a father pities his children, so Yahweh pities those who fear him. Taken together with previous observations of Abraham, the Tanakh implies that Abraham was pious, but far from perfect. I don't think I have enough time, but I just wanted to share the Book of Jubilees, actually, maybe you can read it uh, later, but I shared what the Book of Jubilees says about the Akedah, and it actually it reports a few additional elements that are reminiscent of the story of Job. And it actually talks about Prince Mastema, which is Satan, that is basically challenging Yah to test Abraham the way he challenged Yah to test Job. So that's what Jubilees is telling us. And then the last thought that I have on this chapter is a question that came to me. Did Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac part ways after the Akedah? So in Genesis 22, 19, And Abraham returned to his servants, and they got up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived in Beersheba. No mention of Isaac, as you notice. The story of the Akedah appears to present Abraham's action in a uniformly positive light. However, Isaac's absence at the end of the story and Sarah's death immediately afterwards suggested to some traditional and modern commentators a possible criticism of Abraham. While the text may be unambiguous in its praise of Abraham's devotion to Yah, it also clearly hints at the problem, an irreconcilable rupture in his relationship with Isaac and with Sarah. On the way to the mountain, one phrase is used twice about Abraham and Isaac, and the two of them went together. Yet after the Akedah, a variant of the phrase is used a third time, but in relation to Abraham and his servants, and they walk together. But the word, the two of them, is absent. Abraham walks together with his servants, but the text is loudly silent about Isaac. The omission of Isaac is jarring and suggests some sort of rupture between father and son. Abraham settles back in Beersheba, but Sarah is not there with him. She is residing in Hebron. Check Genesis 23.2. And Sarah died in Kiryat Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. The text most definitely implies that they were not living together after the Akedah. Abraham went from Beersheba to Hebron to mourn for her and bury her. Fast forward to Genesis 24:67, we read, And Isaac brought Rebekah to the tent of Sarah, his mother. And he took Rebekah, and she became his wife. And Isaac loved her and was comforted after the death of his mother. He didn't bring her to the tent of his parents, but to the tent of Sarah, his mother. I suggest that Isaac did not in fact return with Abraham to Beersheba, but instead went to his mother in Hebron. Sarah leaving Beersheba and living separately from her husband in Hebron suggests some sort of rupture between husband and wife too. In short, the text implies that vis-a-vis -vis Yah, Abraham is doing very well, but vis-a-vis -vis Sarah and Isaac, things are far from picture perfect. Any comments, insights? Love the viewpoints. Look forward to insights from others before Thank I say you. anything more. I had a thought about Abraham not protesting about Isaac. 
I was thinking that maybe Isaac was in that section type deal, or just the fact that they were so old and Yah gave it to him. And he saw it as Yah gives and Yah takes away his will, so he was okay with it. Or that in Genesis 13, Yah promises the land to him and his seed forever. So when he says forever to you and your seed, then that must imply that somehow he's going to get old and die and he'll still inherit the land. And his son is going to get old and die and still inherit the land. So maybe he not, might not have worried about it knowing that he had already been promised it. I know that in the book of Gash here, it talks about why Sarah was in Hebron. I don't know if anybody's read that story. It is of Satan coming to her and deceiving her and telling her what Abraham was actually going to be doing. And she frantically was looking for them. And that's how she ended up in Hebron. Like I guess that whether it's true or not, I don't know. And some people don't accept the book of Yasher. Yeah. On that. yeah. But anyways, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I'm not really sure about the whole situation about them having like a break in the marriage. Because I know that at the end, Abraham was like really devastated that when Sarah had passed away in that. But that would be really sad if that was the case, that they didn't have a good relationship at the end there of all of that. But I guess, I don't know if anyone has saw that new movie that has come out um, about his only son. It's called Abraham and Isaac. It's in the theaters. My husband and I went and saw it and I really didn't like the way they portrayed Sarah in the movie. It's the same people that I guess, not the same people, but I think it's the same one. It's affiliated with The Chosen or something that did The Chosen series. But, but I guess I looked at it from a different perspective of the anguish that Sarah must have been going through and he it really portrayed that in the movie about the, just the turmoil back and forth about her wanting to have this child that she couldn't and then blaming Abraham for taking her, her handmaid and then it conceiving mm -hmm. a child. Yeah. But it was really interesting. The only other thing I wanted to mention was Ishmael when Abraham was putting them away, like it did say that Abraham had really grieved that he didn't think that was right and fair. And I know that Yah had said to him, okay, listen to Sarah and, and do that. A lot of people think that that was the end of Ishmael with Abraham, but Abraham was still a part of Ishmael's life. They still would go and see him because we even see that when Abraham died, that Ishmael came to with Isaac and buried yeah. him. And Sarah's tent was in that there Laharoi, where I was talking about where Hagar was at the well. That's mm -hmm. where Isaac's tent, Sarah's tent was. And that's where he went into with Re Rebecca. Rebecca. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really interesting. That was the spot of where Hagar had called out to Yahuwah on that. But yeah. yeah, good stuff. I just want to say that for me, reading the text, it's very clear that there is a rapture there and they are no longer together that Isaac is with Sarah in Hebron and and it's understandable if there was a rapture I mean it's quite a taxing experience on the family so I don't know if everyone can recover from it fully but that's what I'm seeing in the text that definitely there is a separation there and I had another little thought that I wanted to share about Isaac. So when people talk about this story, they normally talk about Abraham's faith. But as I understand it, Isaac was no like little child when this happened. You know, he was big enough to take care of himself. So the fact that he obeyed his father to lay down, let him put wood on him, and then watched him raise up the knife, and Isaac didn't try to run or anything, it was <laughs> Wow, that was faith right there, Isaac, because he was the one that was actually going to die. Yes. Yeah. He definitely must have had faith that he would be resurrected for going through with Yah's command. So it's, it's powerful there. And I really like the thought that you presented as a divine birth, the possibility of that. It's very interesting. We've seen this in other books out there too of possible other occasions of that so i just thought that was very interesting layout and thought on that okay i did like the position of testing abraham that you did i can't say i'm in the camp that abraham was perfect i think you laid a good position that there must have been something else there happening and with him de doing that deal with abimelech 
And the way you position, I thought that was very good response to what transpires after that. I thought that was excellent. Thank you. Chapter 23. And Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from his dead, and he spoke to the Hittites and said, I am a stranger and an alien among you. Give to me my own burial site among you, so that I may bury my dead from before me. And the Hittites answered Abraham and said to him, Hear us, my Lord, for our mighty prince in our midst. Bury your dead in the choicest of our burial sites. None of us will withhold his burial site from you for burying your dead. And Abraham rose up and bowed to the people of the land and to the Hittites. And he spoke with them, saying, You are willing that I bury my dead from before me. Hear me and intercede for me with Ephron, son of Zohar, that he may sell to me the cave of Bela, which belongs to him, which is at the end of his field. At full value, let him sell it to me in your midst as a burial site. Now Ephron was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites with respect to all who were entering the gate of his city and said, No, my lord, hear me. I give you the field and the cave which is in it. I also give it to you in the sight of the children of my people, I give it to you. Hear your death. And Abraham bowed before the people of the land, and he spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, If only you will hear me, I give the price of the field. Take it from me that I may bury my dead dead. And Ephron answered Abraham and saying to him, My Lord, hear me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. <laughs> Then Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver, at the merchant's current rate. So the field of Ephron, which was in the Machpelah, which was near Mamre, the field and the cave which was in it, with all the trees that were in the field, which were within all its surrounding boundaries, passed. Passed to Abraham as a property in the presence of the Hittites with respect to all who were entering the gates of the city. And thus afterward, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, near Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And the field and the cave, which was in it, passed to Abraham as a burial site from the Hittites. Thank you. I just wanted to talk about the cave of the field of the Machpelah. So the cave of Machpelah is an ancient history dating back to the earliest man and woman in the Bible. Adam and Eve are said to be buried in the cave, the first of four couples to be buried there. Besides Adam and Eve, the three patriarchs and matriarchs of the Jewish people, Abraham and Sarah, Rebecca and Isaac, and Jacob and Leah, are buried there as well. The cave of Machpelah and the field around it located in Hebron where Abraham's first acquisition in the land that he had promised to him and his descendants. After the conquest of the land, Hebron became the capital of the tribe of Judah. King David began his kingship there. From Hebron, he was crowned king of Judah seven years before he was crowned king of Israel in Jerusalem. Since biblical times, the cave of Machpelah has been a place of prayer, meditation, and study. The cave is considered by Jews to be a gateway to the Garden of Eden, where prayers have a special potency. The word Machpelah means doubled. There are multiple interpretations for what this refers to. Rabbis cite, cite two main opinions. Doubled refers to the layouts of the cave, which consists of a cave on top of a cave. Two, just as Kiryat Arba, the town of the four, refers to the four couples who are buried in the cave, so too Machpelah is a reference to these four doubles, Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Leah. Abraham's purchase of the cave of Machpelah is also used as the source for establishing the four different methods by which land can be legally acquired in Jewish law, by money, by deed, by witnesses, and by physical possession. The Torah records that Abraham used all four methods to acquire the cave of Machpelah, 
and the field surrounding it, establishing him and his descendants, Isaac, Jacob, and the Israelites as its rightful owners for all time to come. Since the Bible makes references to hundreds of cities, kings, and places, we would expect to find evidence from on-site excavations. If we, did, if we did not find any such evidence, we would highly question the Bible's claims of inspiration and tend to view it as myth and folklore. We would regard the Bible as the product of human imagination rather than a divinely inspired record about real historical events, about real people living in real cities. At the turn of the century, skeptics viewed the Bible as myth rather than real history. For example, the Bible makes over 40 references to the great Hittite Empire. Up to 120 years ago, no archaeological evidence had been found to corroborate its existence. Just another Bible myth, skeptics charge. However, Shovel and Spade have confirmed that the historical information of the Bible is both accurate and reliable. In 1906, Hugo Winkler uncovered a library of 10,000 clay tablets. These ancient records fully documented the long-lost Hittite Empire and confirmed the reliability of the Bible yet again. Later excavations uncovered um, Bogatskoy, the capital city of this mythical quote-unquote empire. This discovery is not only authentic at scripture, but also illuminate many aspects of bi biblical culture. Abraham's purchase of Ephron's field records the following. So the field of Ephron, which was in the Machpelah, which was near Mamre, the field and the cave which was in it, with all the trees that were in the field, which were within all its surrounding boundaries, passed. The, this reflects the standard Hittite real estate procedure, which was found in those 10,000 clay tablets. So they had a procedure of counting the trees involved in any purchase or sale of land. Note also that the witnesses to Abraham's purchase were the sons of Chet i.e. the Hittites. Today, so many Bible cities, names, and events have been unearthed through archaeology that the Bible is considered the single most important historical document in existence. Many lost cities have been located using the Bible as a roadmap. So startling and impressive are some of the finds that one archaeologist was compelled to say they are digging up the Bible stories. Many writers of the minimalist or Copenhagen School of Biblical Scholarship, popular during the 90s and 2000s, but still active today, have argued that much of the Tanakh and essentially all of the history prior to the Babylonian captivity in 586 BC is a fictional creation of later Jewish writers. But such claims can no longer be defended in light of numerous items of evidence which specifically mention ancient kings such as David and ancient battles such as the wars with Sanchiriv. Indeed, the latest archaeological evidence confirms that at least some of the key details of the Tanakh are genuine. Similarly, claims that Yeshua was not a historical figure have largely been defeated and at the present time have no standing in peer-reviewed biblical studies literature. This field, by the way, includes Jews, Christians, and secular scholars such as Bart Herman, who have no personal or religious stake in the matter. Herman summarizes the consensus of the New Testament scholars in these terms. Despite this enormous range of opinion, there are several points on which virtually all scholars of antiquity agree. Jesus was a Jewish man, known to be a preacher and teacher, who was crucified in Jerusalem during the reign of the Roman Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea. And on the next slide, I just included a brief summary of some of the archaeological history from the Tanakh. You know that I do it every now and then. I include archaeological findings and references to it. The cave of the Machpelah actually in Israel is completely 
uh, controlled by Muslims and we are actually not allowed, the Israeli Jews are not allowed to visit the cave, which you can imagine what kind of a religious tension it creates in the country. Any thought, any comments are welcome. Yeah, I've had a thought, I don't know if it's legitimate, but about the, uh, the negotiation for the land yeah. in the cave, that Abraham was just like, name your price, I'll pay it. And I read a little bit about it and they said that the going rate for what it was would have been something like a quarter of the price that he ended up saying. It would have been like 100 shekels instead of 400 shekels. But Abraham <laughs> paid it. And I wonder if that is like something Abraham always did or if it's like a biblical way about going about things where you don't haggle or try to talk people down on each other price and just pay them whatever they think it's worth type deal. Or if he just wanted that particular piece of land so bad he was willing to pay anything. I think he, I think the main point was that he wanted to make sure that no one in the future will say that this land doesn't belong to his descendants. So he, I think he was willing to pay way more just to make sure that he has the deed and it's recorded that this land no longer belongs to anyone other than his descendants. Yeah, I agree with that one. I thought it was also funny, the negotiation was funny because the Efron was saying, ah, what is 400 uh, silver shekels between you and I? Just take it. And Abraham is, okay, here you go, 400 uh, silver shekels. And yeah, exactly. He wanted the assurance of the ownership of that property. Yeah, he didn't want a gift. Yep. Any yeah, other? We've seen it where this has been taken back. Yeah. Chapter 24, I'm going to read, and it's a very long chapter, and then Rob is going to comment on this chapter. Now, Abraham was old, advanced in age, and Yahweh had blessed Abraham in everything. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his house, who had charge of all he had, Please put your hand under my thigh, that I may make you swear by Yahweh the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose midst I am dwelling, but that you will go to my land and to my family and take a wife for my son, for Isaac. And the servant said to him, Perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then return to your, your son to the land from whence you came? Abraham said to him, you must take care that you do not return my son there. Yahweh, the God of heaven, who took me from the house of my father and from the land of my family, and who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, To your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. And if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you shall be released from this oath of mine. Only you must not return my son there. Then the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and he swore to him concerning this matter. And the servant took ten camels from his master's camels, and he went with all kinds of his master's good things in his hand. And he arose and went to Aram Naraim, to the city of Nahor. And he met the and he made the camels kneel outside the city at the well of water. At the time of evening, toward the time, the women went out to draw water. And he said, O Yahweh, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show loyal love to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are going out to draw water. And let it be that the girl to whom I shall say, Please offer your jar that I may drink, and who says, Drink, and I will also water your camels. She is the one you have chosen for your servant for Isaac. By her I will know that you have shown loyal love to my master. <clears throat> And it happened that before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, the brother of Abraham, came out, and her jar was on her shoulder. Now the girl was very pleasing in appearance. She was a virgin, no man had known her. 
and she went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up. And the servant ran to meet her, and he said, Please let me drink a little of the water from your jar. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly lowered her jar in her hand and gave him a drink. When she finished giving him a drink, she said, I will also draw water for your camels until they finish drinking. And she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water. And she drew water for all his camels. And the man was gazing at her silently to know if Yahweh had made his journey successful or not. And it happened that as the camels finished drinking, the man took a gold ring of a half shekel in weight and two bracelets for her arms, ten shekels in weight, and said, Please tell me, whose daughter are you? Is there a place at the house of your father for us to spend the night? And she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. Then she said to him, We have bought straw and fodder in abundance, as well as a place to spend the night. And the man knelt down and worshipped Yahweh. And he said, Blessed be Yahweh, God of my master Abraham, who has not withheld his loyal love and his faithfulness from my master. I was on the way, and Yahweh led me to the house of my master's brother. Then the girl ran and reported these things to the household of her mother. Now Rebecca had a brother, and his name was Laban. And Laban ran out to the men toward the spring. And when he saw the ring and the bracelets on the arms of his sister, and heard the words of Rebecca, his sister, who said, Thus the man spoke to me. He went to the man, and behold, he was standing with the camels at the spring. And he said, Come, O blessed one of Yahweh, why do you stand outside? Now I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. And the man came to the house and applauded the camels, and he gave straw and fodder to the camels, and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. And food was placed before him to eat, and he said, I will not eat until I have told my errand, and he said, Speak. And he said, I am the servant of Abraham. Now Yahweh has blessed my master exceedingly, and he has become great. He has given to him sheep and cattle, silver and gold, male slaves and female slaves and camels and donkeys. And Sarah, the wife of my master, has borne a son to my master after her old age. And he has given to him all that he has. And my master made me swear, saying, Do not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I am living. But you shall go to the house of my father and to my family, and you shall take a wife for my son. And I said to my master, Perhaps the woman will not follow. And he said to me, Yahweh, before whom I have walked, shall send his angel with you, and will make your journey successful, and you shall take a wife for my son from my family, and from the house of my father. Then you shall be released from my oath when you come to my family, and if they will not give a woman to you, then you will be released from my oath. Then today I came to the spring, and I said, O oh, Yahweh, God of my master Abraham, if you would please make my journey successful upon which I am going. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water. Let it be that the young woman who comes out to draw water to whom I say, Please give me a little water to drink from your jar. Let her say to me, Drink, I will also draw water for your camels. She is the woman from Yahweh, whom Yahweh has appointed for the son of my master. I had not yet finished speaking to myself when, behold, Rebekah was coming out with her jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew water. And I said to her, Please give me a drink. And she asked and let down her jar from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give a drink to your camels also. Then I drank, and she gave a drink to the camels also. Then I asked her and said, Whose daughter are you? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, son of Nahor, who Milka bore to him. And I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. 
and I knelt down and worshipped Yahweh and I praised Yahweh, the God of my master, Abraham, who led me on the right way to take the daughter of the brother of my master for his son. So now, if you are going to deal loyally and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me so that I may turn to the right or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and they said, The matter is gone out from Yahweh. We are not able to speak bad or good to you. Here is Rebekah before you. Take her and go. Let her be a wife for the son of your master as Yahweh has spoken. And it happened that when the servant of Abraham heard their words, he bowed down to the ground to Yahweh. And the servant brought out silver jewelry and gold jewelry and garments, and he gave them to Rebekah. And he gave precious gifts to her brother and to her mother. And he and the men who were with him ate and drank, and they spent the night, and they got up in the morning, and he said, Let me go to my master. And her brother and her mother said, let the girl remain with us ten days or so, after that she may go. And he said to them, Do not delay me. Now Yahweh has made my journey successful. Let me go. I must go to my master. And they said, Let us call the girl and ask her opinion. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So they sent away Rebekah their sister and her nurse and the servant of Abraham and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, You are our sister. May you become countless thousands and may your offspring take possession of the gate of his enemies. And Rebekah and her maidservants arose and they mounted the camels and followed the men and the servant took Rebekah and left. Now Isaac was coming from the direction of Be'er Leheroi, and he was living in the land of the Negev. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field early in the evening, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, Behold, camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes and saw Isaac, and she got down from the camel. And she said to the servant, Who is this man walking around in the field to meet us? And the servant said, That is my master. And she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. And Isaac brought her to the tent of Sarah, his mother. And he took Rebekah, and she became his wife. And Isaac loved her and was comforted after the death of his mother. In this chapter, I want to talk about a few things. One, quickly go over Isaac the promised seed and the symbolism that's in this chapter. We see Abraham as representative to the father and Isaac being his son. Then we have regarding the father, the promised son. Rebecca is a virgin and the bride is pure that is spoken about. Abraham's Helper, which is the one who goes looking for the wife for his son, and the Ruach HaKodesh is the helper. So this helper looking for the wife on behalf of Abraham is similar to the Ruach being sent out to find the pure among his people to be betrothed. So I find that there's some similarities in this story that I just wanted to point out for those to ponder upon. I want to talk about the gold ring, the half shekel, the two bracelets, and ten shekels of weight that's put on Rebekah. We see here in verses 21 and 22, And the man was gazing at her silently to know if Yahweh had made his journey successful or not. And it happened that as the camels finished drinking, the man took a gold ring, and we know this was a gold ring that he put on her nose, of half shekel weight, and two bracelets for her arms of 10 shekel of weight. So Proverbs 11.22, a ring of gold in a snout of a pig is a beautiful woman without discretion. So a nose ring of gold on a chosen woman is a beautiful woman with discretion, according to that proverb, looking at the opposites. So the power to discern what is responsible or socially appropriate 
she had this ability to discern what's responsible and socially, socially appropriate by seeing this man, welcoming him, giving him water, and then giving his camels water. She fits in the proverb of a gold ring and a beautiful woman would be a beautiful woman having discretion. Then in Exodus 30, 11 through 16, let's look at the half shekel and weight. What kind of symbolism is there? And Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, when you take a census of the Israelites to count them, they will each give the ransom of his life for Yahweh when counting them. And a plague will not be among them when counting them. This they will give everyone who is counted a half shekel, according to the sanctuary shekel, which is 20 ger per shekel. The half shekel is a contribution for Yahweh. Everyone who is counted from 20 years old and above will give the contribution of Yahweh. The rich will not give more and the poor will not give less than a half shekel to give contribution of Yahweh to make atonement for their lives. And you will take the atonement money from the Israelites and give it to the service of the tent of assembly. And it will be as a memorial for the Israelites before Yahweh to make atonement for your lives. The symbolism of the weight of this half shekel is atonement for her life in the service of her actions. So I just found that very interesting how this gold ring just fits for selecting her and the, the weight of it is due to the service of her actions too. So it's just very interesting how that tied in with what he gave her regarding the gold ring. Then let's talk about the two bracelets. So in Numbers 19, 15, each container that is open that does not have a lid, and that word there is bracelet, that does not have a lid cord on it is unclean. And this is in the context of this container being around a dead person about what's clean and what's unclean. Basically, this container needs to have some type of lid cord. And that word for lid is bracelet. It's a tesmid, H6781. I don't know if I said that right, Romy, but it's a mead. Abraham's servant decides that Rebecca is the person Isaac is supposed to marry. He gives her two bracelets as something of a pre-engagement gift. Bracelets, of course, are worn on the wrists so that they are connected with our actions and choices. These bracelets can be seen as a way to connect Rebecca to Isaac, or at least a modern engagement ring. With the heavy bracelets, Rebecca is promised to Isaac and thus is denied to other men. This example reinforces this understanding. A bracelet separates a thing from its environment, preserving the state of its object from any non-designated influences. So that word bracelet lid has that same meaning. It's very interesting. Sirach 2121, like a golden ornament is instructed to a prudent person and like a bracelet on the right arm. So it's tying in that bracelet on the right arm is instruction to a prudent person. Leviticus 27.5, and if from five years of the age up to 20 years of age, and that's the age range of Rebecca happens to be, then your proper value shall be 20 shekels for the male and 10 shekels for the female. Value people would pay for a vow. That's in Leviticus. This is this value that people pay for a vow. So if that fits in the 10 shekel weights mm -hmm. is fitting in for a female of that age. So I thought that was very interesting that the two bracelets weighed that amount. Numbers 786. The 12 golden dishes filled with incense, each dish weighing 10 shekels, according to the sanctuary shekel, once again, mm -hmm. all the gold of the dishes, 120. These offerings at the tabernacle consecration, these 12 golden dishes were offerings at the tabernacle secretion, and each of those also weighed 10 shekels. The golden dishes may represent, through the 10 shekel weight, purity, as they are filled with incense, which is spiritually representative of prayers. Another interesting point on this. Mm. All right, let's talk about the oath on the testicles. Then the servant put the hand under the thigh of Abraham's master, and he swore to him concerning this matter. 
The thigh was considered the source of prosperity in the ancient world, or more properly, the loins or the testicles. The phrase under the thigh could be a euphemism for on the loins. There are two reasons why someone would take an oath on this matter. Abraham was promised a seed by Yah, and this covenantal blessing was passed on to Isaac and Jacob. Abraham made his trusted servant swear on the seed of Abraham that he would find a wife for Isaac. Two, Abraham had received circumcision as the sign of the covenant. Our custom is to swear on a Bible, let's say. The Hebrew custom was to swear on circumcision, the mark of God's covenant. The idea of swearing on one's loins is found in other cultures as well. The English word testify is directly related oh, wow. to the word testicles. So I do believe that this hand on the thigh was likely the grabbing of the groin and making a testimony, a, a, an oath on that for this scenario with Abraham. All right. Why the 10 days? Genesis twenty four fifty five. and her brother and her mother said, let the girl remain with us 10 days or so. After that, she may go. It's related to testing. Daniel 1, 12, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us some of the vegetables and let us eat and let us drink water. And in Revelation 2, 10, do not be afraid of those things which you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison so that you may be tested and you will experience affliction 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. 10 days are symbolic for testing one's judgment or decision to be true. And I believe that's why they wanted 10 days to see if Rebecca would change her mind <laughs> or it be true for this decision to be made. So that was what I dug into for this chapter and looking for feedback. And then after that, I got one more question. With that, I'm done. Open it up for questions. First of all, I want to say brilliant points. I love every one of them. Regarding the 10 days, I have an inherent suspicion of Laban, whatever he says or does after what he did to Jacob. So when I read that verse, I'm like, I wonder what he was trying to connive at that time. Oh, so, uh, guaranteed. I'd be up I, knowing, knowing more about him. Later, yeah. That you, you try to play he, something. Yeah, he was. Playing, yeah, there was a game here. The ought on the testicles, I never heard about it, and it makes a lot of sense and amazing. And then I love what you did with the gold ring and the bracelets, how you connected that here. Amazing because yeah, I didn't find that anywhere. I did all that research myself and digging that, into it. Wow, that's amazing because the Bible doesn't waste ink, it doesn't waste water. So if the Bible mentions half shekel, ten shekels, there is a point. There is always a point. Uh, so you connected the dots and you found the points and it's just beautiful. Thank you. Okay, any comments from anyone else? Yeah, I think that that was really interesting about the 10 shekels. I had not seen that before. I definitely made a note of that. That was really, I really like that, how you connected that in Leviticus. And and yeah, I never saw that before. I thought that was really interesting. And I was going to make a comment on about Jacob as well, because I always read when in, in number 30 there, when he says, when he come out, when he came out and he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrist. And when he heard that the words of Rebecca, and then he said that he went out to the man like right away. So you could see like the guy was like a shyster, like right there when he says it, all he was looking at was <laughs> the jewelry that was on her. Yes. So then you get a, like an ideology of what he was like there. Um, so I thought that was really funny reading that yes. and doesn't surprise you later on after reading that. Yeah. And, and to I add also, to the, add, just to add to that thought you're on right now is that when he approached the servant, just imagine his thought because he was there with many men. He wasn't alone. He had many men with him. Yeah. yeah. The entourage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. I never thought okay. of that either. And so in the other one that I had that kind of stood out to me in the reading was in 14 when he, when Abraham was, oh, when the servant was there and he was calling out to Yahuwah 
and asking him to find favor. But the thing that stood out to me was that he was really specific in his prayer to Yah. And I thought to myself, I think that's really important for us as believers when we're praying to Yah, that we really should be specific with Yah, because he was saying to Yah, if she says this, like Hmm. he was so specific and to the wording. And I think that's how we need to be in our prayers when we're asking him or to find favor in him that we are really specific in, in, in asking that. So I thought that was really interesting. But thank you. That was really good, Rob. Especially if we yeah, need thanks. a sign. Yeah, yeah, and you brought up the question I was going to ask, and that was regarding the prayer mentioned in verses 12 to 14, and then to reiterate it in verses 42 to 44 about his specification on what he was expecting. And she fulfilled that. And I agree with you. I, and I wanted to ask that question too. Has anyone else ever done that? I know I have prayed something specific. If this happens, then I'll I'll do this type of thing. And I, it's happened, and so I did it. Because <laughs> if I'm going to pray for it, and if this happens, I'm going to do what I said. So but if anyone I else out there, yeah, I don't think that. it was meant as a prayer, like a condition. If you give me this, I'll do this, or if you do that, I'll do. I think it was meant more as a prayer of asking for a sign so then you were just saying yeah, yeah, I, I, see this I don't mean it yeah i didn't mean oh, okay. it for that intention i didn't pray okay. that prayer what i'm what i an example of, i i would use is if i am driving my car and if there is someone that i need to talk with or give money to or something yeah. that's why i say leave me there show that person reveal that person to me something like that mm-hmm. yeah I wanted to give a, another connection to what you were saying about the planet. The firstborn was considered the beginning of the patriarch's strength. Like Jacob says it, I think a couple others say it, that their firstborn is the beginning of their strength. And the thigh is the strongest muscle in the body. And there's a lot of other places when they refer to the thigh, they're like, oh, the strength of your men's thighs type deal. That's like how to do that strength. But it's interesting that the beginning of a man's strength is his first child. So it definitely connects there. And I was wondering, based on the idea of loins, seed, thigh, strength, what does that say about Yeshua having a name written on his thigh? Yep. Or they also strike the, his thigh, right? The thigh bone, it's the femur, isn't it? And that, that's the hardest bone to break. And the thighs being the, the biggest muscles too. And there's one more I just thought of is that when they do the bitter water for the woman that's suspected of adultery, it said her belly, mm-hmm. belly and her thighs will shrivel. Yeah, I believe we went over that one, Ronnie, in Deuteronomy, I think. I don't know. Somehow I can't remember it. <laughs> that's the beauty. We forget and then we read it and all of a sudden we see new things. Absolutely. Any other thoughts? My other thoughts on this one was about in 59, when they would start praying to bless Rebecca to, for her journey. I thought that was really important because what stood out for me in this, and this is, I think this is one thing that I always re- admired about the Jewish people in that is because they're always blessing their children. And I think that's a lot to be said of that and how important it is that we do bless our children and that when we go to send them off or when we pray for them, that we speak blessings over them. So I really like that part of that passage. Yeah, I love it too. I Growing up every, at the end of every Shabbat, we had a little ritual differentiating Shabbat from the rest of the week and basically saying goodbye to Shabbat. And at the end of that uh, process, my dad would always put his hands on my head and on the heads of my siblings and bless us. I really miss it and it brings tears to my eyes remembering it. For this week, uh, we had many verses, 145, and hardly nothing. I just found like a couple of variants between LXX and Masoretic text and then we hardly had any fragments from DSS for this chapter. I couldn't even measure the variants. So that's the tickers for this week. And Rob, you want to close? We thank you for this time that we have together to study your word, to share it with each other, to learn from each other. 
to grow more in depth in your words and to expand our thoughts so that we may better know you and that we walk in obedience to your words. May we be examples and lights to all those around us. May we be humble and may we be full of grace. May we share your love to others and may you be glorified in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you everyone and we hope that this has been a blessing to you.